let's talk about Max Caulfield, the 18-year-old Arcadia Bay resident and Blackwell student who we consider to be the main protagonist in Life is Strange. Some of her details and some opinions and theories. As usual, there are spoilers ahead. If you haven't played, I recommend you do so or watch a playthrough, form some opinions and theories and then come back and watch this theory video to see what you think. Maxine, or Max as she prefers to be called, is an interesting character as the story and the story and journey of others seem to be interconnected. Max is shy, socially awkward, and seems to have a difficult time putting herself or even her photographic work out there. She was born on September 21st, 1995 to parents Vanessa and Ryan Caulfield. She developed the hobby of taking photographs as a child and so her parents encouraged her to pursue it. She prefers analog cameras over digital digital cameras, which is something she has in common with William Price, Chloe's deceased father. Max and Chloe were childhood best friends who roamed Arcadia Bay pretending to be pirates and making plans to travel away from Arcadia Bay. Seattle, a place which Max and her family eventually moves to after the death of Chloe's father, was one place Chloe and Max dreamed of venturing to together. Max seems particularly close to Dana, Kate, and Warren, friendships that were already in place before we start playing as Max in episode 1. Max had apparently planned to contact contact Chloe eventually after returning to Arcadia Bay to attend Blackwell, but as we find out she never does until she fatefully runs into her in episode 1 of the game. We can also find that, for some inexplicable reason, Max hadn't contacted Chloe at all after moving away. Max doesn't really offer up an explanation for this, only that she got caught up living in a new place and that she never forgot Chloe even though she never bothered to contact her. Max notes herself as always looking through a lens, implying she is only an observer and this seems to certainly have been the case, which is why Max is the character who exhibits the most amount of growth in the game. In a sense, yes, she's an observer. The main story has had little to do with her directly and has more to do with Chloe and the people around her, but she's being put in this position to suddenly be dropped into confronting very real situations, having to save her friends over and over, having to stand up to dangerous situations and people to deal with the repercussions of being given the power to alter lives and time itself. This has pushed Max out of her comfort zone in a way I don't think would have happened to her otherwise. This is the polar opposite of Chloe, who is more about taking action now and thinking later. She willfully jumps into dangerous situations. She's confident, self-assured, indulgent, and aggressive even. But as far as personal growth goes, Chloe is at an impasse. She's more set in her ways, stubborn and impulsive. I think this makes these to an incredibly interesting dynamic. Two best friends at a really important and turbulent point in their lives who are at different ends of the personality spectrum. I also think this is why Chloe plays just as big a role in the game as Max. Without Chloe being who she is in this reality, Max would not get her powers. She would not be able to grow. She would not be put in this role of saving people. And without Max being who she is in this reality, Chloe would not get the chance at future growth. She would not get to realize that this is all bigger than her, that it's not just about people abandoning her. Chloe would be dead. Each is vital for the story's progression, and each is at an important transitional state, much like Arcadia Bay and its residents, all who seem to be sort of bouncing off of each other in the bigger picture, each choice or outcome having a small ripple effect. The destiny is bound to the destiny of others, and vice versa. In the alternate reality, we can see Max and Chloe are different people in different situations, and yet the whole of Arcadia Bay is still transitioning, Max and Chloe both being unable to have an effect on guiding the transition to its outcome because they simply aren't the same people. Max is my personal favourite character for many reasons. I can relate to her, and as players, many of us are very emotionally invested in Max's journey. I personally believe it's because the game allows us to hear all of Max's internal dialogue, all her intimate private thoughts about life, school, music, people, relationships, insecurities, and so on. Of course, it's also because we're experiencing those ripple effects too. We're experiencing growth as we play the game, we're thinking about what we know, the consequences of what we do, and we're reacting differently differently to things based off of what we learn, and that affects the world around us, well, in-game anyway. Similarly to what is happening to everyone in Arcadia Bay, and this is why the game is so powerfully engaging. We are part of the transition, but here's my one problem with hearing Max's internal dialogue. The bias that comes with it. 
It's great if you can recognize this and separate yourself from it, but it's also very easy to fall into it, oftentimes without realizing you have. Max is a person. She has her own thoughts, feelings, likes, and dislikes. She sees the world around her in her own individual way, determined by her personality and life experiences, much like you and I. Here's where the trouble lies when it comes to how we judge, interact, and make choices about the characters in the game. Max's truth is not necessarily factual truth. I'm not saying that she lies, rather, I'm saying there's a difference between subjective truth and objective truth. I talk in some of my other theory videos about shades of grey regarding people. People aren't necessarily all bad or all good, not even Max. This is an important part of the game, and here's why. Max's subjective truth influences our subjective truth, which is often mistaken as objective truth. Max doesn't like Nathan from the moment she meets him. This is an opinion formed before we are even introduced to Max and she's been given good reason not to. So have we. But because our relationship with Nathan as Max can only be negative, we are very likely to see Nathan as nothing more than a villain, which makes it very difficult to find anything redeeming about him at all, or to even imagine he's a person with many different qualities and sides and feelings. This goes to the point of finding guilt even in situations that haven't necessarily pointed at guilt. Once we don't like someone, all our association with that person tends to become negative, and assuming other characters are entirely trustworthy, even though we know so little about them. I mean, we've known Max for parts of four days. Why are we so certain she's a good character in every regard? Imagine if instead of playing as Max, we played as Victoria. We don't care much for Victoria playing as Max. It's difficult to do so when all we see is a judgmental bully. But what would we perceive her as if we heard all her intimate thoughts and insecurities? What if we saw the positive sides of Nathan more than his negatives and knew his intimate thoughts rather than seeing his defensive exterior? We would think of everyone quite differently and I can bet we would even find Victoria and Nathan relatable on some level. And what would we think of Max then? Being in insecure and shy doesn't always come off as that. Many people Max sees in a neutral light have barely even interacted with her before we start playing the game. Juliet is a good example of this. In episode 1, she asks Max why she cares about her problems and asks her if she even bothered to know her last name because she never talks. I took from this, Juliet thought Max just didn't care as opposed to how Max really feels, which is shy and awkward. This happens to me all the time. I am extremely shy in person and oftentimes because of that people think I I'm deliberately not talking to or engaging them because I just don't want to or because I don't like them or have no interest in them, which more often than not is not true in the least, but nonetheless, they end up having a negative impression on me. And what about all the snooping Max does? We know her reasons and our own, so we justify it. But what if we didn't? What would you think of a person you don't know very well who welcomes themselves into your space and digs through your personal belongings and tries to meddle in your affairs? It's an interesting part of the game, one of my personal favorites that adds a lot of depth, this underlying message of reminding yourself that people are more complex than they are often perceived as, and how important it is to step outside of ourselves and to try to understand people and things from different perspectives and angles. Just because we don't like a situation or person doesn't make it inherently bad or evil. So what is Max's purpose to the plot? I see three things Max could possibly be providing assistance to in the plot, and they aren't necessarily separate or intertwined, but for the sake of saving you from my confusing ramblings, I will speak of them as separate things in this video as a way to have a look at the elements broken down and simplified. A greater purpose, I believe, is to help bring things to a close, whatever that may be in regards to the bigger picture in the game. But in what way will she get to that close? Will she do this by finding a way to save Chloe once and for all, learning she has to let her go, or by helping Chloe bring light to the darkness in Arcadia Bay. That is assuming the problem is not Max's powers or Chloe's life. Once she does this, I believe things will return to a normal, definite pattern. Ultimately, I'm thinking she will lose her powers, having fulfilled her role and returning stability back to their timeline. Saving Chloe is certainly Max's priority. We've seen Max save Chloe two or three times in the past four episodes, and I'm sure she will be saved at least once more. It's important here to remember when Max got her powers, which is right before Nathan accidentally kills Chloe. And I say accidentally, as I've pointed this out in previous videos and I'm thoroughly convinced at this point that this was not a purposeful act. Nobody would ever even miss your punk ass, would they? Get that gun away from me, psycho! Oh, shit! No, 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 no! Unlike this.
Why would it be so important for Max in this reality to save Chloe from Nathan? Why was this not the case where Chloe gets into a car crash in the alternate reality and loses all sense of ability to live and function normally, ultimately dying in a tragically long drawn out process? Why did Destiny not place Max by Chloe in this circumstance but that did in the main or first reality? More importantly, why do we not get the option to do so in the game? Why this moment to be chosen to be given the power of time control? I think the answer might be less about saving Chloe and more about saving Chloe in that particular situation. Maybe because Nathan isn't the main villain and maybe because without having seen this incident and being able to change it, Max would never have started down the path of finding the real answers to the bigger issue in Arcadia Bay, whatever that may be. Consider this, if the universe wants Chloe dead, then why in this perfect moment to do so did the universe grant Max the power to change it? If Nathan is the big bad behind all of this, then why did we stop the one action that would have had real, unavoidable, yes, I mean unavoidable, consequences for him? Why did we save him? He could have shot and killed Chloe, and Max would have turned on the fire alarm, and then what? What could he do to avoid being caught? Run away? There would be no avoiding an investigation into a murder that happened right in the school, especially when there's a witness who saw the entire thing. It would certainly not be as easy to cover up a dead girl at the school as it was to cover up a missing 19 year old. I do not believe the Prescotts are totally invulnerable. I think they're just careful and surely if two teenage girls can find the darkroom, the police also could, were they given the reason to. I mean, all we had to do to be led there was search Nathan's room and look through David's coordinates and speaking of David, wouldn't he pursue his investigations even further after his stepdaughter gets killed? Surely he could piece things together or even assist the police investigation with the information he does know. Finding the dark room would bring light to every other crime they've committed. It would place blame on the Prescotts for certain and I'm sure it wouldn't be too difficult from there to figure out who else is working with them. I mean, okay, if they're invulnerable, then why the secrecy? Why are they hiding their actions in the darkroom all the way out of town in a hidden underground bunker that to get into requires a key and a password? Why are they avoiding telling people like Frank its address and instead guiding him to it? Why is Mr. Jefferson avoiding any association with the Prescotts? Why the temporary phones? If they're invulnerable, why do they care? Alternatively, Maybe part of the necessary process for Max is to learn to let go, that she can't control destiny, that there was never anything she could do to help change Chloe's life. Max insists in her journal entries that she couldn't have just been put in that bathroom to watch Chloe die. She insists it was her destiny to save her. So why does Chloe keep dying? Even dying in the alternate reality where her whole life is changed and different, better even. This doesn't necessarily have to correlate to the tornado directly, or it's possible that that it's adding to it, like Max meddling with destiny is making time even more unstable, which could point out why she seems to get visions of the tornado when Chloe is near. Maybe the visions are a warning, trying to show her the consequences of her actions. Maybe Max having powers isn't part of her destiny. Maybe someone else has given them to her. Maybe someone who knows Chloe's life, the storm, Arcadia Bay, and the bigger plot are all connected, and to end everything, she'll need to save Chloe to ultimately let her die, meaning her powers were never intended for saving Chloe, rather. She used them to do so because what she uses them for is up to her. Maybe whoever or whatever is responsible for giving Max her powers knows that Chloe is a necessity for helping Max in her transition and piecing together everything that she needs to know. But maybe they also know that Chloe's life will always be temporary because there's no avoiding her destiny. At the end of episode 3, when Max is trying to save William, Chloe says, She's never leaving me, referring to whether or not Max will be staying for dinner, and William responds, That makes all of us, which ultimately were his last words to Chloe. You'll be here too, right? She's never leaving me. That makes all of us. Hearing that immediately reminds me of Chloe and Max early in the same episode while swimming in the Blackwell pool after hours. Don't look so sad. I'm never leaving you. <laughs> Once you get over yourself, you're gonna make the world bow. As long as you're there with me. Don't look so sad. I'm never leaving you. 
And if the tornado is not about Max's powers making time unstable or Chloe's life, is it possible it's about something else? Mr. Jefferson in the darkroom, or does it go further than that to the Prescotts who are destroying Arcadia Bay in real ways, polluting the water, buying out tribe lands and building pan estates, and of course the now cult-like elitist Vortex Club being supported by them? I've always had this feeling Nathan or Mr. Jefferson or the Prescotts help maybe all of them together know about Max's powers more or less, or even the approaching storm. I mean, why do we see Nathan talk about the storm in the trailer for episode 4? How would he know this? How would they? And if they do, what do they plan to do with that information? Is it possible Arcadia Bay itself is reacting to all of what's happening inside it? I mean, is it a special place where mystical things are more inclined to occur? We have time traveling, precogs, spirit animals, and apocalyptic signs, laws, and legends. Samuel talks about Arcadia Bay like it's a person, and that's one thing, but Joyce does it too in the alternate reality. I mean, maybe Arcadia Bay does want to be left alone. So with the heavy stuff out of the way, let's talk about Max's possible intimate relationships. The possible romance with Warren has always been intriguing for me because it's so dependent on how the player chooses to act with Warren. I really love that aspect and you can see her personal thoughts shifting towards him if you choose and you get these cute little snippets of a budding romantic relationship or if not you can see how she decisively wants to keep the friendship platonic and you can see her questioning if it's okay to do or say certain things because she doesn't want to lead him on. On the other hand I think her feelings towards Chloe are the same regardless of choice. The only outcome depending on if she reveals her feelings may be eventually accurate acting on them or not. I think the tipping points being when Chloe jokingly dares Max to kiss her and when Warren asks Max to go on a date. Warren and Chloe are sort of opposites here too. Warren is a little shy, not exactly direct about his feelings for Max, but he definitely does try to low-key put himself out there. He's also a lot more supportive of Max in a sense. He's the friend who provides her emotional support, who is kind and who focuses on her and her issues, thoughts and feelings. Chloe is a little more complicated. She's more direct and aggressive. She can be supportive, but given her situation, she tends to focus a lot more on herself and on Rachel, and less on Max. She also tends to blame. She doesn't exactly say the right thing sometimes when Max is upset. They're both great friends, but differently, and Max is certainly lucky to have two people who are willing to jump into dangerous situations to protect her. I'm actually really excited to see if the romantic relationships actually go anywhere in episode 5. Well, that's all for now. As usual, keep in mind that I don't believe in any definitive right or wrong answers as far as theories go. I'm pretty open. These videos are more about sharing my strongest gut feelings and providing as much evidence behind them as I can, hopefully providing you with information or different angles you hadn't considered yet and getting you asking questions that could spark some theories of your own. So whether you agree or disagree, please share your thoughts in the comments. I'm always interested in hearing your opinions. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and would like to see more in the future.